So, found out about why we think systematic lit reviews are good. Talk to you about how you can go about being systematic to find your literature. And as mentioned, that's something you can do with whatever literature review style then you then go on to use. Knowing that you've got the literature is really powerful. But now you've got this little stack of papers. You might have 20, 30, 50, 300 of them. This is one of the biggest challenges with doing a lit review. It's all that information. And maybe you're old fashioned like me and you have it in paper, or maybe you're much more sophisticated now and you've got it on your iPad in your um, EndNote library. But whatever it is, it's there and not here. And so one of the things that's really important to do for any literature review, but particularly for the style that we're talking about, is to convert that into your own personal database. And this is more than just an EndNote database we're talking about here. So what we're going to go through is how I suggest you structure a database, entering the first 10% of the literature, then testing and revising the categories you're going to use in that database to make sure they're right, then entering the bulk of the research, and then producing some summary tables to give you an idea, well, so what is the literature saying? What, where is the literature? And really importantly, where are the gaps? So this is the next set of steps from 6 to 10 that we're going through here. Now with this, I'm talking about a database. The database, you can choose what you want to enter it into. You could have it as an access database. You could have it as part of a more sophisticated EndNote. You could be really smart as a computing person and create your own structured database. We have to, I have to say, have generally found that just a straight Excel file with columns as the categories and rows for each paper worked fine. So have a think about that. Go for whichever one you suits. But with that, think carefully not only about what the categories are, but how you're going to enter the data in it. And often we might enter it in words. So you might say the city, and we might say the country, but you might also then want to use a numerical code for some of it to count things up, presence or absence. If you have lots of different countries, it might actually be easier to have the, well, certainly for continents, to have each of them as a separate column and a one or zero if it's present or absent in that country. So have a think carefully about that. And this is part of that whole process of doing the database. This is why we say you're going to have to spend some time working out your categories, then you're going to trial it. Now, categories about the research. Oddly enough, some of the ones that we found the most important is the geographical location. And this is where was the research conducted? Now, if it's in a lab, it may not matter. If it's, in this case, it may be what materials come into being to used, but for a lot of research it matters where it was conducted. Certainly in ecology, certainly in social science, a lot of legal areas, a whole lot of others, matters where. So here we suggest you use several different categories of location. You want sometimes really specific information and sometimes very general, so you should enter it in several levels of detail. So for example on one of our community gardens we had it where was the city the gardens were located? What state were they in? What country? What continent? But also, sometimes what's important, what climatic zone? So for ecological projects, it's really important to know what was the climate. So in that case, we used a system of climatic, sub, um, tropical, tropical, arctic, alpine, all of those sort of things. For ecological ones, we also put in the general habitat type. So have a think about your area. What are the critical geographical features that you want to record about your data? As I say though, have, you might have up to 10 categories in your database that are for each of these types of, each of these pieces of information. One of the things we've found that's really important, although a pain, is it's generally better to have too many categories, but then it's easy to go you've got all of the data there and sometimes it's then easy to collapse. Then it is later go, oh really I actually need to separate those categories out. I really should have recorded the city and then you have to go back through all of the papers. The next thing you might want to do is you might want to include some details about weighting of the methods and the studies. How are they used? What type of do, do some studies weight more or are more important than others? Now this is where for example if you're working your way through to one of these meta-analysis, you're going to be including this information. Some discipline areas have really well-defined categories for quality of the controls of the studies. So classically, in the Cochrane reviews and the others, the gold standard in health is randomised controlled studies, randomised blind controlled studies in fact. 
But in other areas, particularly the social science, their categories aren't so obvious and there aren't necessarily one is better than the other as opposed to different. So you might use a quantitative survey for one paper might include that and another might include in-depth interviews, but both of them or focus groups, but all of those have provided useful information. So have a think about that sort of information. Are you going to weight them? Is there some categories? And what's the relevant ones in your discipline? So you can then go through and in include that information as columns in it. What type of methods are used? Because this, a lot of the value of the paper is the reliability of these methods. So you need to think about categories for that. And again, you might have summative categories like were the, was the research quantitative or qualitative or both? And then go through each of the individual types and work those out. So was it this type, that type, the focus groups? Um, in-depth interviews, etc. Text analysis, was it randomised control trials, Barchi before after control impact, all of that sort of detail. Then you need categories for the variables. What did they measure? So in terms of birds, it was we included information about what was the species of birds, was it one or more species of birds, and what guilds of birds were included. So for the gardens it was what type of gardens were included, what was the definition, those types of things. Then you need categories for the results. So there's methods, how do they collect the data, subjects, what do they collect the data on, and results, what do they find. And here you need to work out what sort of categories. In some cases it's going to be fairly straightforward. In others it's actually more subtle, and this is again one of the reasons why often this database will include more information than if you're going to use a meta-analysis because not all of the um, data may be suitable for meta-analysis, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. So with um, some of the social studies, we've often found that they might discuss a benefit, and that's different to whether they demonstrated it. So we often had two categories, discussed and demonstrated. So you might need to do that. You might also want to put out, was it statistically significant? That's the criteria. So you need to think about what those results are. And as I mentioned, with things like the birds, we found that some of them looked at a whole range of responses. So was it a physiological response? Was it a change in number? Was it a change in diversity? Was it a change in abundance of birds? Because all of those things have been looked at. So we had lots of different categories for the types of response variables and then the types of results of those response variables. Was it positive, negative or neutral? Did it result in an increase in the number of birds, had no effect on the number of birds, or a decrease in the number of birds? Because some categories can go up and down, so you need to think about that as well. Now what we suggest is you lay out, all, you have a careful thought about these categories, have a go at working them out, set up your database, and then enter about 10% of the data. Or, depending on how much data you've got, about 10, 15, 20 papers. And the reason for this is that you'll often have in mind what your categories are, but then when you actually go to do it, you find it's not like that. There's extra things you haven't found. The categories aren't as easy to apply. You might need subcategories, things like that. So we find it's really worthwhile testing how well your database works as sets of categories, making sure it's realistic, seeing how much difficult there was, modifying at that point. So on the diagram you can see we've got an initiative process here between defining the categories, entering the data and revising them. So you're getting that right. And the reason is that again, making the mistakes early in your database is really worthwhile because if you make them later, back through the whole pile of papers, going through all of them and adding. If you add another category in the last 10%, you're going to have to go back and read the first 90% of the papers to see what they did about that category. Again careful thought at this point saves a lot of time and the students who've done this with me keep saying make that point clear it's really worth it so as you see I've put in there other categories narrow or broad do you need additional values new subcategories do the criteria apply to the original work in all of reality so have a good think about that one now the next step is starting to is, is enter the rest of the papers. So enter all of the rest of the data. Sometimes you may then still have to revise the categories, but you're pretty much okay. Now, this is a relatively 
you have to be not asleep, you have to be thinking, but it's a relatively mechanical task. So you might want, not want to sit there and do this for 24 hours a day for seven days. You might want to set yourself aside, however best you work a certain amount of time to do it each day, and then take a break, go for a walk, have a coffee, come back, do some more, that type of a thing. But it's going to take you a while to do it, and it's mildly boring, but it's worth it. Once you've got the database finished, once you're pretty sure about it, and again, have a careful think again here. Do a quick little check on the data, on the searches to see if there's any more papers out there. Are my categories really good? Everything worked out? Am I ready to move on to creating some summary tables? Now, the interesting thing about it is when you do these summary tables, you'll find mistakes in your database. And that's one of the reasons why it's worth doing it. And you most, might have to do it two or three times because the first time you're checking that you actually spelt America correctly every time. You didn't use a comma somewhere and a full stop somewhere else or little things like that. You think you've been consistent, but it's when you generate these summary tables you find you've got these little odd results. Now again, you can do this in very sophisticated ways, pivot tables or from access database picking up things, or you can do it fairly simply with counts and things like that. Whatever works for you. So some simple ones that we've produced as summaries to give you an idea is about the geographical spread of the studies. And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that in the four reviews that we've done, three that have already published using this method, we found that nearly always there was the same pattern. Predominantly the research was done in North America, then in Europe, some in Australia, and relatively less from many other parts of the world. So an obvious thing to do to begin with is to map the discipline. Where geographically is the literature based? And so you can just, at this case, produce tables that summarise which continents, which climatic zones, which countries. For example, for the community garden work, you can see here, we found that the research was predominantly in North America and from the US. And then, because that was such an important part of it, we actually mapped where in the US, which states, and then even more specifically, which cities did the research come from. And as you can see from the figure, there's a really strong geographical bias even within the United States of where the community garden research was done. Same thing we've had with birds, shark tourism, street trees, all sorts of things. We know that there are certain places that predominantly do research and we've got some citation papers here that are available in some of them that tell you about how about 70% of the research in science, uh, often even higher than that, is in English language journals and a large proportion of it is coming out of North America. But that pattern's likely to change in the future. And here we've got another one, which is about um, some of the actual data, showing you the way that we can count up the number of studies. So this is where we're moving in these summary tables, from the systematic to the quantitative. What we're doing is we're counting how many studies have been done looking at which, which variables. For the um, study looking at the impacts of nature-based tourism on birds, it was looking at how many were the methods, observational, experimental, what type of activities have been looked at, those types of things. And you can start to see really rapidly, you get patterns. And one of the things that's important about this is you're mapping the gaps. Now, for a, uh, somebody doing a literature review, one of the most important things in a PhD is knowing where the gaps are, because that's where you might want to do your work to address some of those gaps. So here's your way of overtly showing where those gaps are. So generate the databases, start to have a look and think about it. We've got a whole list of the types of things, obviously geographical spread, methods, result, research subjects, how many bird species, etc. results. Those are going to be the types of tables you're going to present here. Go through all of those, generate them, start to get a feel for your data. So is it all correct? Is it comprehensive? Do I get it right in the database? But also, where are the gaps? What are the patterns? What am I starting to find? And start thinking about your research. What have you found using the systematic and now quantitative information about this literature? And when you've had a really careful think about that, then you can start on the really challenging task of turning that into a paper.